Well, you voted for it, you asked for it, so we're going to be talking about pedophilia today. To do that, I asked you all to read an article that was written by a Norwegian philosopher, Ole Martin Moen, um, in which he tries to take kind of an objective view of what pedophilia is and the ethics of pedophilia. So let me just say a few words about that um, before we jump into the topic itself. So this ethical issue, like a lot of other, uh, other ethical issues that we've been discussing and will discuss in this class, generates certain reactions in us, right? Gut reactions, certain emotions. But it's very helpful in philosophy, I would say necessary even, that if we're going to get a good handle on the ethics of this issue, that we take kind of an objective view of it, and we try to take an analytical approach and not let our emotions cloud our judgments so much. It's okay to have a visceral reaction to what we're going to be discussing today, but if we're going to talk about the ethics of it, we need to do that kind of in a logical, argumentative way, rather than on arguments or rhetoric based on emotion. So I think that's what Moen is trying to do in this piece. He's trying to take something of an objective approach. He's going to try to look at the issue objectively. And I think it would also be a good idea for us to not think he necessarily supports or is advocating for pedophilia here. Um, generally, when you read authors, any author, um, a good way to do that is to presume they're arguing in good faith and not to assassinate their character unnecessarily, unless they give you some sort of evidence that they're not thinking or acting in good faith. So I think we should start from that space. I think we should start by looking at this issue, looking at what Moen says about this issue kind of from an objective standpoint and not think too poorly of him from the get-go because he's talking about this issue. The reason that he's writing about this at all is not to provide or try to advocate for widespread support or normalization of pedophilia, but because he doesn't think pedophilia has been thoroughly understood or analyzed within the field of philosophy. So pedophilia has been widely criticized. It is still widely criticized today. But it hasn't received the same sort of philosophical treatment that other ethical issues have in the field of philosophy. I can't spell today. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so in this piece, Moen kind of makes it clear that he's going to be analyzing and discussing the issue of pedophilia, how it differs from adult child sex, and the production, distribution, and consumption of pedophilic materials. His focus is going to be in the latter half of this essay on the consumption of pedophilic materials, of child pornography, and whether or not consuming it is immoral, but we'll get there. Now you will have noticed I wrote this out in a particular way, right? I said he's going to analyze and discuss pedophilia adult child sex, and the consumption of child pornography. It's important that I wrote it out this way, because there is a distinction between pedophilia and adult child sex. They're not the same thing. Does anybody know what this distinction is from 
reading the article. Do all pedophiles engage in adult child sex? You're shaking your head. No, why? You could use the word obsession. That's not the word that's normally used in the definition. But yeah, you're on the right track. Pedophilia, as defined by the World Health Organization, is sexual attraction to children, usually of prepubertal or early pubertal age. I think the word that the WHO actually uses is sexual preference for children. <clears throat> I always have problems spelling this word too. And this is the definition that Moen provides in this article, this WHO definition from 2010. So already, he's revealed a distinction to us between pedophilia, sexual attraction, or sexual preference for children, and adult child sex, which actually involves some sort of physical sexual activity with kids. This distinction is going to become important for the ethical analysis that he's going to be providing in this essay. Bless you. Moen also wants to argue in this essay that how we ought to morally think of pedophilia and adult child sex, how we ought to psych psychiatrically think of these things, and how we might practically think of these things are all distinct as well. So our moral... psychiatric and our practical assessments of this issue are also distinct and will vary, probably. So what does he mean by this? Let's break it down a little bit. So first of all, we can talk about the ethics the morality of having a certain sexual attraction towards children, that's one part of it. We can talk about the ethics or the morality of engaging in adult child sex, that's another part of this issue. But then we can also look at this issue psychiatrically and practically. And what he means by psychiatrically is something like psychologically, right? It's generally argued in the literature that Pedophilia is some sort of disorder or some psychological dis-ease, if not a disease. But then also we might wonder, is it good for people personally to experience this kind of attraction? Is it practical for them? And is it practical for society? These are all different ways of viewing this issue. We can view it morally, psychologically, and practically. And he's going to be providing different analyses of this issue through these different lenses. The basic argument that Moen is going to be putting forth in this essay is that merely being a pedophile, having sexual attraction to children, or consuming child porn doesn't seem to be moral or immoral, necessarily. And adult child sex is immoral sometimes, but not necessarily all the time. As we go through this, we will talk about this because I'm eager to get y'all's opinions on this.
So I'll just stop here and ask y'all's opinion. What do you think of this view? That being a pedophile, having a certain sexual attraction is not necessarily moral or immoral. And that consuming child porn isn't necessarily immoral. But that adult child sex is immoral sometimes. Not necessarily all the time. What do you think? Do you agree with part of it? All of it? None of it? None of it. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody agree with part of it? Can you control your sexual preference? Is it immoral to have it then? Is it immoral to be gay? You're saying no, it's not immoral to have that attraction, right? Why would it be immoral then in this instance if it's something that people can't control? Is there something different about this sexual attraction? Ah, okay, so you're talking about child porn. Yeah. But what about having the attraction? Having the attraction isn't illegal, right? <laughs> Engaging in adult child sex is illegal, though, right? Yeah. You can't control, like, your, like, like, what your body is attracted to, I guess, and you can also control your actions thereafter. Like, you're definitely free from everything. Right. Right. So is having the attraction then immoral, let's say, compared to actually engaging in adult child sex? Obviously, I think the whole thing's bad, but I understand what, it, what it's saying, that like the attraction isn't necessarily immoral, because just like one of the, the, like, the topics that we talked about, like if it's not hurting anybody, like, yeah, don't get me wrong, that's, that's weird, like, to, to think that that's like sex, like whatever. But I think that if someone's doing it in the comfort of their own home, in their own bedroom, where they're not hurting anybody and whatever it is, like I understand why someone would say that it's not immoral because you can't help it. Like, okay. If that's what you like, that's what you like. But like, once it gets to like doing something about it, especially to like a child, like that's definitely where you draw the line. That's moral. Okay. Anybody agree with that? Does that sound right to you all? Does anybody agree with? the whole of this argument, this statement. Okay. That's kind of like a normal reaction to this issue, right? A lot of people intuitively want to say that there's something wrong with the attraction itself, right? That there's something that's gone wrong there. If not morally, maybe psychologically, right? Because at least in the psychological literature, isn't pedophilia treated as some sort of disorder? Keep that in the back of your heads as we move forward. Because we can discuss whether or not merely having the preference itself is moral or immoral. But I think the more interesting discussion that Moen provides is his discussion of adult child sex. And he breaks down a few different arguments that are given in favor of <laughs> the idea that adult child sex is always immoral. And he tries to rebut some of these arguments. So let's walk through some of those now. Because that's where I think the real meat of this discussion is. Why do people generally oppose adult child sex? Why do we think it's wrong? Because there's one party that cannot consent. Ah, okay. That's one issue, right? The issue of consent. How about more basically? What kind of effects does adult child sex 
generally have on children. Does it help them? Does it harm them? What do you think? Usually it harms the child. Usually it harms the child, right? In what ways? Mentally, physically. If they're being, if the adult is forcing on the child, that can hurt them. Right. I think one of the most common arguments that is brought to this issue is that, at least when we're talking about adult child sex, is that adult child sex is wrong, it's immoral, because it's physically and psychologically harmful to children, right? That's the first argument that Moen considers here. In his discussion of the ethics of pedophilia and adult child sex. However, Moen looks at this argument and he offers some objections to it. Does anybody remember from the article any objections he brings to this argument? That adult child sex is physically and or psychologically harmful to children. Yeah? He was saying that sometimes, or a lot of times, it only psychologically affects them later on in life they have an understanding of like cultural norms more? Ah, yes, that is one thing that he brings up. One of the things that he brings up is, well, it seems that there are instances of adult child sex in which when the children is, or the child is engaged in the activity and soon afterwards, they don't feel a really, they don't feel a particularly bad way about it. What he thinks might be true is the way that we discuss pedophilia and the way that we talk and judge uh, adult child sex is that sometimes this can end up producing a state of affairs in which our, the cultural attitudes that we have and the way that we educate children may cause them to think and presume that such contact is harmful and bad for them. So there's kind of a social analysis here. It's not that the activity is always bad in and of itself, but that children who have had these experiences end up retroactively judging the experience as bad because of social conditioning or because of certain forms of cultural attitudes or education. Are there any other objections he brings to this argument? How about the kinds of activities that pedophiles tend to engage in? One of the things that Moen notes is that the most common pedophilic activities are not penetration. They're cuddling, caressing, and genital fondling. He thinks penetration is obviously, could be uh, at least physically harmful, right? But if the most common pedophilic activities are actually cuddling and caressing and general fondling, there's no physical pain there, right? 
So at least in a lot of instances, it doesn't seem like adult child activity is physically harmful to the child. Make sure I spell this right now. This is another objection that he brings to this argument. But he also brings a third objection, which looks at the empirical evidence that we have for whether or not adult child sexual activity is harmful. He looks at the studies and he's read the literature and he notes that these studies tend to rely on non-representative samples of children who have engaged in this activity. Does anybody know what he means by this? Those studies that look at how children view the, these activities that they've had with adults, he says that they're, they rely on non-representative samples. What does he mean by that? Anybody have any idea? Let's say a researcher is studying pedophilia and the consequences of adult child sexual activity. They sent out a survey for people to complete. What kind of people are going to complete that survey? It, let's say it's sent out to children who, or they might be adults now, but people who have had sexual activity with adults as children. Who's going to fill out that survey and contribute to the research? Who's most likely to do that? Well, it's people who have had a bad experience, right? Those are the people who are going to contend to contribute to this kind of research. If you were a child and you had some sort of pleasurable sexual activity with an adult and you don't look upon it badly, you're not going to tend to engage in these kinds of surveys, right? But if something bad happened to you, you, you would want to contribute to this research in that way. Right, Because you want to get the word out that, hey, this is bad, this happened to me, and warn other people of it, right? So a lot of the empirical evidence that we have for the harmful effects of adult child sex is that they're skewed in a particular direction. The people that respond to these surveys and the people that contribute to this empirical research are, more often than not, the vast majority of them are people who have had bad experiences. We don't hear the stories of the children who have had pleasurable or good, good experiences when engaging sexually with adults. So the empirical studies rely on a non-representative sample of children. That's what he says. There's one more objection he brings to this claim. Because if you note, this argument kind of has implicitly within it the idea that children are not sexual beings that they shouldn't be engaging in sexual activity, that they shouldn't be thinking about or really engaging with that stuff at all. But Moen thinks this presumption is problematic. He thinks, or at least he argues in this piece, that it can be justifiably argued that children are in fact sexual beings. If any of y'all have babysat for a lot of times, you may have been party to a child engaging in masturbation, right, before they reach puberty. Has anybody had that experience or heard of that or seen that? 
It's not uncommon. And so what Moen is trying to basically bring to the table with this objection is the idea that children are not sexual beings is just wrong. They might not have the same concept of sexuality that we do, really understand to the same degree what they're doing if they engage in sexual activity as adults do, but children do sexual things sometimes, and they might engage with others sexually, other children sexually. So to presume that children and sex do not and should not ever mix is based on a faulty misunderstanding of the nature of children. So what do y'all think of his objections here? Are any of them good? Do you buy them? Is he partly right or is he totally wrong? Or is he totally right? Yeah. Mm. Even if the child didn't know that it was bad, like, you know, for an extended period of their life, once you get older, you realize, like, how violating that is. So, like, if they can recall that, like, in their adulthood, or even, like, when they get older and be a teenager, they'll come to realize, like, how long that really was for it to happen to them. Mm. So let me kind of um, defend Moen a little bit here. He's not saying that cultural attitudes and education are the reason that children look on these experiences and think something bad happened to them. But he thinks they can play a contributory role. So they factor into how children retroactively think about their sexual experiences with adults. They might not be the reason, but they play a role. And we should consider that when we're evaluating how children think and feel about this kind of activity. I can see the cultural attitude definitely being a part because um, like old people used to marry like 12 year old girls and everybody was just cool with that. Okay, say more about that. So like you see all these paintings and it's like this beautiful young girl getting married to this old decrepit man and you're like, I feel bad for her. Like she didn't choose that. Like arranged marriages and stuff were like, they're still going on. Like people in other countries are getting married to old people. Like it just feels not right. And like it just depends on your culture where like people will force you into a marriage with an adult or tell you that that's the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. You need to get somebody your age. Like, you know? Yeah. So we might presume that all instances of marriage like that or sexual activity in which there's someone of uh, pubescent age engaging with an adult is bad. But do all cultures think that way? And do all people who are engaged in those kinds of relationships also view it as bad and harmful? What do you think? Um, I think there's another question here. What are we defining as children? Is it like just prepubescent or is it like out of high school? Because I know a lot of people from back home who've been dating since they were 13, having sex at 13, now they're getting married. Mm. And then there are other times when there are 16 year olds dating 19 year olds having sex. So like, what are the limits? Right. What pedophilia is. Yeah, how does our conversation change if we're talking about 16 year olds versus 10 year olds? Does it change? What do you think? If a 19 year old has sex with a 17 year old, is that pedophilia? Is that wrong and immoral? Well, like, the age of consent in Pennsylvania is, like, 15 years old or something. So, like, when mm. both of the parties can consent to it, I don't think it's, you know, immoral or wrong. But, like, you know, when it, we're talking about, like, a child that's eight years old or, you know, five years old that doesn't even know what, like, sex is, then I think it's immoral. Okay, so there's a difference between maybe teens having sex and an adult or a teen having sex with a kid who hasn't gone through puberty yet, maybe. There's this woman who everybody's up in arms on the internet about, and she was 16 
and she met this like 28 year old man in a theater group and ever since then they've been like together and now they're getting married and people are like well he's a pedophile like that's just weird like you met i don't know i feel like adults have such different experiences than like children and i would define a child as somebody under the age of 18 um and adults have such different experiences that i don't think that like anything good can come of their relationship you know like mm. you're just living different lives like i don't understand somebody who's in college dating somebody in the high school i just i feel like that's so strange okay uh, and it's not because of the age necessarily right because but because of the maturity level maybe what life experiences they've had. We use age as a proxy for that, but maybe age isn't the important thing, right? It's more like maturity level or experience. Because a lot of you don't seem to want to say that a 19-year-old having sex with a 17-year-old is bad, but maybe a 17-year-old having sex with a 12-year-old is, or a 24-year-old having sex with a 12-year-old. Ah, okay. Yeah, so there's also a physical aspect to it, a biological aspect, right? So, in discussing this first argument, I think Moen wants to get us to reconsider the idea that all instances of adult child sex are harmful to the child. And that seems to matter, right? Because we presume that they are, but if we could find a child that actually didn't have a bad time, that is not traumatized, would we say that it's all that wrong then? Okay. I certainly think there are adults living today who have had sexual activity with adults as kids, but are not traumatized by it. But you might still object to adult child sex on the grounds that the child can consent to it, right? The child can consent to it, then something obviously has gone wrong here, right? And it shouldn't have happened. That's the second argument that Moen discusses here. He says, sometimes people put forth the argument that adult child sex is immoral because children can't consent to the activity. Does anybody here think that this argument is right? It's wrong because the child can't consent. It would be different if, you know, the sexual activity was between two consenting parties. I think this argument makes sense. But Moen devises an interesting objection to this argument. He says, what's interesting about the consent argument is that it seems to rely on the harm argument. So only if the harm argument is sound, only if we can demonstrate that the child was harmed, can we say that the activity was immoral. Inability to consent by itself is not enough to show that the activity was immoral. He walks us through this argument on pages 116 and 117 under the, the heading, the consent argument. 
Another common argument as to why it is wrong to engage in adult child sex is the consent argument. This argument can also be formulated in terms of two premises. First, that it is wrong to engage in sex without consent. Second, that children cannot consent to sex such that all sex involving children becomes non-consensual and therefore immoral. The consent argument has strong intuitive appeal. And David Finkelhor, one of the world's leading pedophilia researchers, makes the case that the consent argument is even stronger than the harm argument. He explains that the harm argument is empirically vulnerable. It depends on the empirical fact of harm, which is sometimes questionable. The consent argument, by contrast, does not depend on uncertain empirical facts to the same degree. As such, he says the consent argument is more robust. Though Finkelhor might be right that the harm argument is empirically vulnerable, he is wrong in claiming that the consent argument is any less vulnerable. The reason why is that the consent argument is dependent on the harm argument. To see why, consider first the mundane fact that there are many things to which children may consent. If I ask my 10-year-old son if we should go play basketball, and he says yes, and then we go on to play basketball, nothing wrong has happened here, right? The same would be true for going on a ski trip, watching a children's movie, or perhaps baking a cake. On the other hand, there are things to which children may not consent. If I suggested that my son and I go play with guns, get drunk, or have sex, it would not be permissible to follow through on these suggestions, irrespective of his consent. Why may children consent to some things, but not to other things? The central explanation seems to be that while some things are harmful, other things are not. And while adults have the privilege to consent to harmful things, children do not have the same privilege or do not have it to the same extent. Thus, the reason why the consent argument depends on the harm argument, therefore, is that only if the harm argument is sound do we have a good explanation of why children cannot rightfully consent to sex. Had adult child sex posed no risk of harm at all, it is unclear why children cannot consent to it. Perhaps it could be suggested that children cannot consent to sex because they are not sufficiently physically or psychologically developed to know what they are consenting to. But true as this might be, in the absence of any risk of harm, this does not seem to be problematic either. If my son ventured to read Hegel, it is evident that he would not know what he was doing. Still, since this would presumably not expose him to any significant risk of harm, there would be nothing wrong in letting him do so. Even if we accept that the consent argument depends on the harm argument, however, it does not follow that the consent argument is eliminated. Arguably, the harm argument vindicates the consent argument and does so by virtue of providing an explanation as to why sex is something to which children, given their level of autonomy and understanding, cannot consent. Still, within the scope of the present discussion, the consent argument does not add much either. While the harm argument states that it is wrong to expose a child to a significant risk of serious harm, the consent argument states that it is wrong to expose a child, or sorry, the consent argument states that this is wrong even if the child consents. Since this is already implicit in the harm argument, I shall proceed on the assumption that it is the harm argument that provides the central explanation of why it is morally wrong for adults to engage in adult child sex. So what he's saying here is that the consent argument doesn't really stand on its own. The consent argument gets its force, it gets its power from the fact that we think adult child sex ends up posing a significant risk of harm to the child. And that's why we say that adult child sex is immoral for the adult to engage in. Not because the child can't consent. Children do things all the time that they can't consent to, and we don't think it's bad or immoral. But that adult child sex seems to expose the child to a significant risk of harm. And that's why it's immoral. What do you all think about that? Does that make sense? 
Or do you think, no, consent by itself is a necessary component to determine if this, is, if this action is moral or immoral? Okay, so what does that cause you to think about the argument he's making here? That cons consent by itself is not, a lot, not enough to determine the morality of adult child sex. You buy that? It's tricky, right? I think he's making a good argument here, but we still want to say that there's something wrong about engaging in an activity with a child that they don't consent to, right? There's something about that that rubs us the wrong way. No pun intended. <laughs> but I don't know. Is there anybody who's like, yeah, I mean, he's got a good point here. I think what makes it worse is because the adult, the, like, the adult knows. Like, the adult knows that the, the child, that, like, they don't know what's going to happen, like, what is going on. I think that that is what makes it so messed up is because, like, the adult knows that, like, this is, this is kind of wrong. Like, this is a little bit messed up, but, like, they're still going to do it. Okay, so you think, you think in a lot of instances of adult child sex, the pedophile kind of knows that they're not doing something right. Yeah. And that makes it bad, at least in a way. I would think at least at least a little just because I feel like most even most pedophiles are aware that like this this is not something that's socially acceptable like no, nobody's gonna be like yeah pedophiles like no like nobody's doing that so I think that like at least in the back of their head like I think that it's mo most messed up because they know what they're doing like could possibly cause harm anything even if it's just like the cuddling and stuff like that okay like, that still could be like it's still wrong what if the adult has the every best intention in the world. Does that change the activity? The morality of the activity? What do you mean best intention? Like, if, I mean, if he's trying to is, have sex with a kid, that's not a good intention. Well, think, think about it this way. Try to, as uncomfortable as it may be, try to put yourselves in the, in the shoes of a pedophile. No, that's okay. <laughs> if you're a pedophile, you might be thinking, like, sex is an amazing part of life. I can really help this child along in awakening their sexuality if we engage in this thing. I don't intend to harm the child. I don't want to harm the child. I might be doing the child a service here. What if they think like that? Just object. Why is it their decision? Then Whose decision? Like, the, the, oh, the adult's decision? No, why do they get to make that, de that decision for the child? I mean, it, and I, I think like it's there's a weird line between like if it's your own child, like unfortunately, like that's that's a rough situation when that's your own kid. Like nobody's gonna tell you that you can't do something with your own kid unless they like get to a unless certain it's point. Unless it's sexual, right? Unless you get to a point, but usually that's kept on closed doors. Like people don't usually know about, especially if it's your own kid. Like don't usually know about it until something happens. Right. Well, when parents make their kids do things they don't want to do all the time, but we don't really make a stink about that. But there does seem to be something different about sexual activity, right? We want to say something like. The child can't understand what's going on. They don't have a concept of sex, really, or how this is going to impact them in the future. So I tend to lean on the side of, you know, even if the pedophile has good intentions, that does not vindicate the activity. What do you think? Are you in agreement with that? I just feel like there really is no good intentions in that. Like, even if he is trying to say, oh, it's beneficial to the kid. No, you're, they're lying to themselves to try to make them feel good about it. No, that's wrong. The kid doesn't understand what's happening, and the adult is taking advantage of that. They're using that for themselves. That's wrong. Okay. There's another element to this, too, that we haven't mentioned, right? 
There's something different about two consenting adults having sex, which is, at least one of the aspects is, they're kind of on a level playing field, right? When it comes to adult child sex, isn't there a power difference here? Isn't there a difference of authority, perhaps, as well? Yes. Like, the whole thing, the adult is using that to their advantage. Right. Like, there's a known power dynamic, so the kid just goes along with anything because they're an adult and they're forced to listen to their adult all their life. They're saying, listen to adults, blah, blah, blah. Yes, it's abusive. It's wrong. Okay. So that's an element that I don't think Moen discusses very much here, but I think it's an important element to this whole issue, right? There's also that power imbalance. And that's something that we should consider. Well, let's look at the final argument that he responds to in this piece, or at least the final argument that I wrote down in my notes that I think is important, which has to do not so much with adult child sex, but consumption of child porn. There's some people who just think across the board, consuming child porn is immoral and bad. And there are lots of arguments given for this take. One argument is that consuming child porn is immoral because it ends up causing more real world adult child sex. This is something you've heard before, right? I'll write it out as, this argument says, consuming child porn is immoral because it increases rates of adult child sex. How do you think Moen is going to respond to this argument? He's going to respond to it in a similar way that he responded to the first argument, the harm argument. I feel like people could justify it by saying, well, if they're not actually doing anything with the kids, then there's nothing wrong with just watching. Right. That's going to be an aspect to this. But what about this claim specifically? It increases rates of adult child sex. How do you think he's going to try to rebut this? So like maybe that it can like limit it because it like satisfies them. That's one, that seems to be one aspect implicit to his response. He's going to look at the empirical data. He's going to see, actually, if consuming child porn ends up increasing rates of adult child sex. And guess what he finds? At least according to the data he looks at, the empirical findings do not support this claim that consuming child porn increases rates of adult child sex. Rather, we have evidence that the, the opposite is true. He talks about this on page 119. So far I have considered the ethical status of being a pedophile and of engaging in adult child sex. How, however, should we assess ways to satisfy pedophilic preferences? that do not involve any actual children, such as the enjoyment of fictional stories and computer-generated graphics with pedophilic content. Even though most of us might think such stories and graphics are less bad than adult child sex, there still seems to be something troubling about them. And in most countries, they are banned, right? In most countries, child porn is banned. Nearly having it is a criminal offense. But what makes such texts and graphics bad? 
it seems clear that we cannot appeal to the to harm to virtual children, since presumably virtual children cannot be harmed. But one explanation might be that even though virtual children cannot be harmed, real children can be harmed as a result of what goes on in virtual reality. It might be argued, for example, that exposure to texts and graphics that sexualize children makes pedophiles more prone to engage in adult child sex in the real world. This argument has some intuitive appeal, as it seems likely that repeated virtual engagement in an activity lowers one's barriers to engaging in that activity outside of the virtual world. In spite of the intuitive appeal, however, the claim is empirically questionable. Dennis Howitt, in a study of pornography usage among pedophiles, concludes that, quote, no clear-cut causal link has been demonstrated between exposure to pornography and sex crime. A similar conclusion has been drawn by Jerome Andros, who recently found that, quote, consuming child pornography alone is not a risk factor for committing hands-on sex offenses, at least not for those subjects who had never committed a hands-on sex offense, unquote. David Reigel has gone one step further and argued that for many pedophiles, Pornography is a tool that helps them redirect their urges and drives and gives them an outlet for their sexual desires in a way that does not involve having sex with real children. Howitt, Andros, and Rigel's conclusions are also given tentative support by broader sociological findings. Milton Diamond has found that when the Czech Republic lifted its ban on pornography, including child porn, in 1989, there was a drop in rape and child sexual abuse. Diamond also found similar negative correlations between the availability of child pornography and adult child sex in Japan. Granted our current knowledge, it therefore seems that texts and computer-generated graphics with pedophilic content do not result in more and may result in less adult child sex. So, some of the empirical findings that we have seem to support the idea that consumption of pedophilic content actually per may prevent more adult child sex than it causes. Bless you. So, let's assume these empirical findings are true. Let's assume that allowing pedophiles to consume child porn actually decreases rates of adult child sex in the real world. What should our response to that be? Should we change how we do things socially? Perhaps change some of our child pornography laws? What do you think? If we're trying to decrease the, the rates of adult child sex, maybe we want to make child porn more available to pedophiles. What do you think? That's a good question. What do you all think? We already have a lot of child porn already, right? The US government has a lot of it. Would we need to actually involve real children to create more? I mean, like, child porn, like, it's like such a broad, like, porn in general is just such a broad aspect of what, like, I mean, Pedophiles would think that a little kid running around in their diaper around the house 
is enough to do whatever. Like, yeah. So that, those are like home videos. You know what I mean? Like, there's you probably have videos on your phone of just like your little cousins, sisters, whatever, just running around. Like, that could be enough just. Or in the bath or whatever it is. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, that could be enough. So I don't think that there there's a need to make more. Would we have to involve real children to make more, though, if we thought that that was a good idea? What's one of the phrases he uses when he's talking about this? He used computer-generated images. Computer-generated graphics. Couldn't we use AI algorithms to create fake child porn? Yeah. Would you have to use a real child porn to like make those algorithms? I don't know. Maybe you could just... Uh, you know, expose the algorithm to a bunch of pictures of children that aren't, you know, undressed or anything like that. And then it fills in the gaps. Should we start funding uh, <laughs> the production of these AI algorithms? If it's going to decrease real instances of adult child sex in the real world? Yeah. Ah. Like, I just don't think that it should be out there at all. Okay. So maybe if we decided to go down this route, we might end up normalizing pedophilia. Is that something that we want to do? Or do we think that's bad? It's just, I think of it like if they consume it a lot, it's like at some point they're just going to be like, all right, I'm tired of seeing this. I want the real thing, you know? Mm, Okay. So you're, you're hesitant to accept that pedophiles are going to be satisfied with adult child porn forever. Yeah, like I'm not going to say like everyone's going to be out looking for it, but there might be some cases where that will make them want to do it more. Mm. Okay. So maybe we do need to conduct more studies. Maybe we need more evidence as to the long-term effects of this. An interesting discussion is being had right now within the field of philosophy and how to deal with the issue of adult child sex. Some people have suggested that we build robots that look like children that pedophiles can have sex with. Is that a good idea? Okay, why not? Cheap and widely available, maybe. But that's not yeah, right now they are. Yeah. But if, you know, giving a pedophile a, a child sex robot ends up causing him not to engage in adult child sex in the real world, isn't that a good thing? Or are you hesitant to accept that? the pedophile is going to be satisfied with the robot forever. What do you think? Oh, um, I don't think it would be a necessarily good thing, but it would make the situation uh, better because it would get more children out of the way. And more real children. And me yeah, it may prevent harm to children that wouldn't otherwise be exposed to sexual harm, right? Maybe. But what might also the production of child sex robots do? We just brought it up. Normalize it. Right. Is that a problem? I think one of the main reasons that child sex is widely unaccepted is because of our like social because if we look back in history, the LGBTQ community wasn't accepted at all. But then people started to normalize it, and now generally the population is accepted. If mm -hmm. we push more like child porn and availability for it, then it will become normalized, just like everything else has. So 
I feel like the whole reason that it's not accepted is because we don't accept it. And if we start, then it can push things along and make it more normal. Do we want to normalize it? No. What do you all think? No. no? Okay, well then what do we do about this situation? What should be our goal in trying to deal ethically with this issue? Anybody have any ideas? A lot of sexual preferences are rooted in childhood trauma and how you were raised. Mm. So generally, like adverse effects are from you know past experiences with whether it's your teacher or your parent, and it doesn't have to be necessarily abuse. It could just be how you're raised. Um, but I mean. I'm in the art therapy program. I would always recommend therapy. Not art therapy? Yeah, not necessarily like put them in a psych ward because they're crazy. I mean, but there are ways. There are um, sex therapists that work with average people, and I don't see why they couldn't work with people with potential Okay, so you're talking about treatment or rehabilitation, perhaps. Not those words. Not specifically, because that insinuates okay. there's something wrong with our client. Ah. It's more of we're supporting our client in the best way to make the best decision. Okay. Okay, that's an interesting point. Do we want to say that there's something wrong with these people? Is that an appropriate label to put on someone who has this, uh, this attraction? Yeah? 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 Does anybody think maybe the label isn't very useful for serving our goals? I mean, people are sexually attracted to like so many. You have people that are attracted to like trees and like blow up dolls and, and cars and stuff like that. Like, are, is something wrong with them too? I mean, what do you think? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I feel like you, people like what they like. Like, you know, like, I, like they're, if they can't change that, they can't change it. But like, I think that it drops, like it crosses the line when it starts to affect other people. Like in this case, like when you start like raping kids and stuff, like yeah, like that's not cool. No. I think one of the things that Moen is trying to get us to reconsider in this piece is how we look at and treat people who have this preference. We have a very strong gut reaction to it, right? We don't like it. We don't think it's good. We don't want to normalize it, it seems like y'all are saying. But you might wonder if the way that we treat a lot of pedophiles and the way that they, we stigmatize them might cause them to engage in behaviors that are not good for others or for themselves. What do you think? Do you think our cultural attitudes of pedophilia end up driving pedophiles never to talk about or work through the attraction? Or no, you're like, whatever. Stigmatize it to all hell, it's bad. I mean, yeah. Say more. Like, because of the fact they don't really want to admit it to anyone or really try to talk through it. It's Be just, because of what? To, Why? Because of stigmatism or just how society is, how people just generally don't really like pedophiles. They kind of just have to accept it by themselves, but because of that, they deal with it in certain unhealthy ways. Okay. I mean, it would make more sense for them to like actually be able to like seek help for it or just, like you said, getting therapy, but, and we kind of set it up where they can, which is messed up, but. It's understandable. All of what we're discussing here has to do with the blameworthiness of pedophilia. Certainly we can blame people for engaging in adult child sex, right? And we can say that's wrong, don't do that. Maybe even punish them for it, right? And that seems like a good thing to a lot of you, correct? But what about how we just treat people who don't engage in the activities, but just have the attraction? Should we treat them differently? Yeah? 
Yeah. Would you say more? No. <laughs> okay. Um, I feel like as I'm going to be a therapist, I feel like we should normalize the attraction, but not normalize the action. So it, they have an opportunity to seek help and see a therapist. That being said, I wouldn't have my kids around that child. That's just me, just because I'm biased. I wouldn't bring my kid around a person I know who's pedophile. So does that make me like flip flop maybe, but I think a lot of people would share that opinion about not wanting their kids around people who have that attraction, right? I think that makes sense. But again, what Moen is trying to get us to consider here is maybe how our cultural attitudes are contributing to the problem of adult child sex. I don't know if he's right, but it's an interesting thing to consider, right? He says, near the end of this piece that pedophiles are blamed harshly and they're often conflated with people who engage in adult child sex, but again, the two things are different. But some of this blame is probably unfounded. I think you would probably say that it doesn't make sense to blame someone for something they can't control, right? It probably doesn't help to have uh, to produce a bad evaluation of one's character based on a sexual preference they can't control. Although we do want to you know, not normalize adult child sex, right? Maybe we do want to stigmatize adult child sex. Now you used an interesting word. You said normalize the attraction. Is that what we want to do? Is there a difference between normalizing something and tolerating it? What does normalization involve? Yeah. I think in this instance it would be like making them feel comfortable to speak, like getting help, rather than like us saying like, you know, well, whatever, like do what you want to do. It's like your preference whatever. I think it's more so like the normalization of it would be like so they can talk about you know their attraction and like get help for it and like pursue like therapy or something. Okay. But even that idea of maybe trying to get these people into therapy implicitly contains this claim that this isn't normal and it shouldn't be normal. No? Yes? Tolerating has a negative effect to it when you're speaking like client base. People seek help for different like disorders like bipolar and depression and those are all normal. I mean just because you know you tolerate the disorder doesn't mean it's not in, like not normal. Okay. So there are two different things normal can mean. Yeah. Right? Normal can mean usual what happens usually, what is usually the case. But normal can also mean it contains you know, the root norm. So maybe what should usually be the case, right? Based on my understanding of what you said, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Bipolar disorder is not uncommon. But does that mean we want to produce a state of affairs in which it should be more common? Or do you kind of see the difference? So how might this relate to pedophilia? Maybe it is not uncommon for some, pe for some amount of people to have a sexual attraction to children, but do we want to produce a state of affairs in which that sexual attraction becomes more common? What do you think? Do we want more people to be sexually attracted to children? I think it sort of falls into the category of like mental illness, not 
like you know, like mental illness, you want people to be able to talk about it. So like you don't want pedophiles to be afraid to get help and say that they are a pedophile. So you want to normalize it in that sense, but not normalize it so that people will continue to do it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I agree just because I don't like pedophilia, but I also want to say that that kind of what she said specifically fits under like gay conversion. Okay, say more about that. It's like when back in the day they said that, you know, the gays were mentally ill and it was an issue. So they sent them to like a conversion camp where they were like mentally abused, physically abused. They were raped by a different sex and it was just like all bad. Do I see some mental instabilities within pedophilia? Yeah, but I don't think pedophilia itself is the mental illness. I think there are different effects from what makes them sexually attracted to children that is their illness, not necessarily pedophilia itself. I think it's an adverse effect to what is actually going on. Okay. So maybe, let me reframe what you said, and then you can tell me if I'm wrong. Maybe we shouldn't blame or look down upon people who have this attraction. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to make the attraction more common. I don't think making it more well known will make it more common. Because uh. it's still socially unacceptable. But if we, because like, I'm pretty sure all of us in the room could say we, are, we don't want to go have sex with kids. But there's also the instance of like, we should make therapy available to mm. pedophiles rather than if you normalize like child porn and this, this, and that, then it will make it widespread and make it more available. But I think you should make available therapy rather than, you know, what, you know, their sexual pleasure is. Okay. Okay, I think that makes sense. In any case, Moen sees people who have the sexual attraction as being equated to people who engage in adult child sex, and he says obviously these two groups are distinct. You know, it seems morally fine and perhaps obligatory that we look down upon adult child sex and we punish it, but maybe we don't want to have the same attitude to people who have the attraction. After all, he says that many pedophiles don't seem to believe they're actually harming the child. In addition, Again, he kind of asks us to try to put ourselves into the pedophile's shoes. And he says, if you had this sexual attraction, I mean, think of how hard your life might be. Would you be able to abstain from sex forever with the social group you're sexually attracted to? He kind of says here that Pedophiles are subject to bad moral luck and that they're attracted to children. He also says, which kind of goes along with your comments, that it's questionable to categorize pedophilia as a disease. And he talks about this on page 121. I think he says this because he thinks that maybe categorizing it that way ends up producing stigma that is antithetical to our social goals of reducing these instances of rape and adult child sex. It is doubtful, however, if an appeal to the nature of pedophilia makes us justified in concluding that it is a disease. A central reason for this is that pedophilia diverges less from normal sexuality than what we often assume. And then he goes on to discuss several reasons for this. But I'd like to just say one more thing. In conclusion, Moen thinks that 
it might be helpful for us to reframe how we view pedophiles versus those who engage in adult child sex. He thinks the sexual attraction itself is not moral or immoral. Adult child sex is immoral, but it may not necessarily be blameworthy in every instance. And he does think that consuming child porn can be morally acceptable. Does anybody want to have one last say on this topic? Put their view out there. No one? I know this is a difficult topic to discuss. I know it elicits very strong reactions within us. But I think there is a way of going about treating this issue in a certain way in which we can get a better handle on what is moral and what is immoral in regards to this topic. Personally, I don't think pedophilia as an attraction, I don't think we should engage in practices that will make it more common. I hope that people who suffer with this attraction get their suffering eased. Um, it's an unfortunate thing to live with, especially those who are affected by it, right? Not just the pedophile, but, you know, children. But I think it's an interesting topic to discuss and important because there is growing support for pedophilia and normalizing the sexual attraction within certain political circles. So I don't know, think, think on that, meditate on that. Thank you for coming to class, everyone. I will see you on Tuesday. Have a lovely weekend.